This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, it's Jeff Ratliff with the Neurology Podcast and Thomas Jefferson University. I am here with Raul Martinez-Fernandez, a neurologist and researcher at HM Sinac at Puerto del Sur University Hospital in Madrid. Raul and colleagues published a paper in neurology in the March 28 issue titled Perspective Long-Term Follow-Up of Focused Ultrasound Unilateral Subthalamotomy for Parkinson's Disease. We wanted to invite him to the podcast to discuss his team's paper and findings. Longtime podcast listeners may recall some previous episodes we've done on focused ultrasound and movement disorders. On May 8th, 2018, Jason Crowell spoke with Jeff Elias from the University of Virginia about focused ultrasound for tremor. There were some further updates in another interview that aired on December 9, 2019, again with Jason Crowell, but this time interviewing Casey Halpern, again about thalamotomy for tremor. Importantly, those interviews did spend some time discussing the methodology behind focus ultrasound and how it works from a a surgical and movement disorder treating perspective. Those interviews were discussing sonication of the thalamus for tremor. And today, Raul and I are going to be speaking about his study using focused ultrasound procedures targeting the subthalamus in patients with Parkinson's disease. Raul, thanks for joining us and for teaching us today. Hello, Jeff, and thank you. And thank you very much for your interest in our paper. Yes, welcome. So, Raul, to start us off, I want to jump in with the primary findings and impact of the study. This was a study of patients with asymmetric Parkinson's disease in whom you intervened with unilateral focused ultrasound subthalamotomy. The primary endpoint that your team was looking at was the score of part three of the MDS Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is the score attributed to their movement disorders exam. So it quantifies the severity of their bradykinesia, their rigidity, and their tremor. Can you tell us the clinical impact of your treatment on Parkinson's disease motor features based on the results of your study here? Our primary outcome was the assessment of Parkinson's disease motor features, but not only of tremor, but also of rigidity and bradykinesia. You have mentioned that thalamotomy is useful and improves tremor, but it doesn't improve significantly the other cardinal features of PD. But on the other hand, subthalamotomy can improve those. So what we have shown here is that the effect of a subthalamic nucleus lesion, it's sustained for up to three years. That is that the initial benefit that we achieve after the treatment can endure for a minimum of three years. This is our our follow-up. Very important, we found no delayed adverse events and those which were present in the short term either improve or resolve in the long run. Well, at the end, what we are showing is, is more evidence to support this new therapy as a therapeutic option for Parkinson's disease. And so now getting into the study details a bit, this study here was an extension of a previous randomized study looking at real versus sham subthalamotomy. And so coming into this study, what did we already know about the impact of subthalamic nucleus focused ultrasound from research that you or other groups have done in the past? This is the extension of the randomized trial and also of our pilot study. It was an open level study of 10 patients, the, the pilot one in 2018. And then we performed and underwent the randomized trial, which was, was published in 2020. These two trials, what show was that in the short term, doing subthalamic ablation in Parkinson's disease patients improved the cardinal Parkinsonian features, tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia. But in those studies, the follow-up was only for up to one year. In fact, the current study is the open-level extension of the randomized trial that that you have mentioned, but also of our pilot study with 10 patients that we performed in 2018. The preliminary evidence that we had is that a subthalamotomy was efficacious and was safe to provide benefit over the Parkinsonian motor manifestations, but only in the short term. This is what we know from the previous studies. Now we are showing that we also have benefit in the long run. In fact, before these ultrasound studies, we didn't know that the subthalamic impact improved Parkinsonian motor features because we have a lot of deep brain stimulation literature. The subthalamic nucleus is the preferred target for deep brain stimulation because it's the most effective to treat uh, all the cardinal features of the condition. So beyond 
the evidence that was shown previously in the short run about subthalamine nucleus ablation improving PD, we could consider as well the evidence from the brain stimulation uh, literature. We, because in the end, conceptually, the treatments are similar. It is modifying an abnormal activity which is underlying the manifestation of, of, this, of these symptoms. So they share somehow the mechanism of action. So in the end, we had a lot of, of literature showing that, again, impacting on the subthalamic nucleus could improve those motor signs. So the patients we're looking at here, as you mentioned, are a open-label extension, some of whom were in a previous sham-controlled cohort. And so based on that cohort, we had already known that the focused ultrasound ablation of the subthalamic nucleus did beget improvements in motor scores in the relative short term in months after the initial ablation. And what this study is showing us is that as we extend out to a three-year follow-up, the improvements of those motor scores are persistent. Do I have that correct from what you just said? Yeah, that is correct. In fact, the, the improvement in the long term is equivalent to the improvement in the short term. We had In the short term, we had about 50% of improvement in the motor UPD res of the treated site. In the long run, we have an equivalent improvement. It's, it's also 50%. This is an open level extension, of course. It's not a double-blinded, randomized trial. But yeah, the, the benefit is sustained. And I think you answer my next question is that the magnitude of this effect, you saw roughly a 50% reduction in those motor scores. And that effect was solidly sustained over the period of follow-up, correct? Exactly. That is correct. In fact, the total motor UPDRS, which assess not only the one side of the body, but both sides and also axial features, even the total UPDRS is still lower than before treatment. That is, three years after subthalamotomy, the total motor status is better than before treatment. It, it has increased. It has increased, but it's still uh, lower than that the baseline score. It has increased because of the non-treated side. We have no had any impact on the untreated side, and the, the scores there worsen because the disease progress. But even with this progression, we can manage the patients well with medication and their global motor status is, is still better than, than before the treatment. It's really impressive to hear. And you touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to transition my questions over to talk a little bit about side effects. And yeah. our listeners may think, you know, back to medical school or learning as in neuroanatomy early on that, that lesions to the subthalamic nucleus can cause hemiballistic or hyperkinetic movements of, of the contralateral body. And drawing on our literature and experience of doing deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, we know that dyskinesia uh, can again be a, a finding in patients who have undergone stimulation there. So given some of that background of, of neurophysiologic and neuroanatomical knowledge, were there side effects like dyskinesia or other hyperkinetic movements in patients who underwent these subthalamotomies or were there other side effects that, that we should be aware of if we're thinking about this as a treatment for our patients with Parkinson's disease? Yes, and I know that this is a critical point of the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, a lot has been said about side effects of subthalamotomy and especially, particularly, dyskinesia. Let me tell you, when we treated our first patient with a subthalamotomy about eight years ago, back in 2016, I remember that patient, a few days after treatment, developed a mild to moderate dyskinesia on his upper limb. It was the first patient that I ever saw with, with a subthalamotomy, and I thought, wow, he's having a dyskinesia. What is going to happen? Is it going to get balism. And my boss, Professor Beso, told me, don't worry, reduce levodopa dosage and then keep calm and see the evolution. And in very few weeks, well, we reduced the levodopa, the dyskinesia dramatically improved. We wait and in very few weeks, the, the dyskinesia practically disappeared, it subsided. But the anti-Parkinsonian effect was huge, which was very high because the STN is certainly prokinetic. The lesion in the STN is certainly prokinetic, but this is also the reason why it has its uh, anti-Parkinsonian effect. In, in this long-term series, was almost 30% of patients had dyskinesia, but in the long term, this dyskinesia become mild levodopa-induced dyskinesia, which are not a management problem in, 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 um, in general in most of the patients. 
And the anti-Parkinsonian effect, it's very high. Those patients who develop this kinesia have a very high improvement in Parkinsonian sites. And in general, we don't find uh, severe dyskinesias. This is partially caused by two reasons. The first is that it is well known from experimental models that the Parkinsonian brain has a higher threshold to develop dyskinesia because by nature it's antikinetic. And the second reason is that we have learned from previous literature, from DBS literature, that if we do a subthalamic impact and we enlarge that impact, in, the, in this case a lesion dorsally, we impact onto a pallidothalamic tract. And this pallidothalamic tract has an anti-dyskinetic effect. Therefore, when we plan a treatment, we plan to, one, impact on the subthalamic nucleus to improve Parkinsonism, and then to enlarge the lesion dorsally to impact on the paleothalamic tract to have this anti-dyskinetic effect. And this is why we don't have usually uh, severe dyskinesias. There are other side effects. In fact, the side effects that which concern me the most are those related to the internal capsule. We have a very high control of the production of the lesion, but it's not 100% of control. So the lesion can spread laterally and can touch, impinge onto the internal capsule. And at that point, you can have weakness or dysartria. It usually doesn't happen. Uh, again, you have a high control of lesion production, but it can happen. Most of the times it's transient or mild, but there's always the risk. That's all helpful to hear. And it sounds like a lot of your experience with side effects from STN ablation are analogous to the side effects that we see with STN stimulation. And if people have dyskinesia from STN stimulation, as your mentor sort of advised, we may reduce the levodopa and we can see improvement there. Or if we stimulate excessively, we can start to see some effects on the internal capsule that can cause weakness or some dysarthria or some other muscle pulling. So it sounds like the side effect profile is pretty similar as we might talk to our subthalamic nucleus DBS patients about. It is true that the profile of side effects is similar, but it is also true that with STN stimulation, you can change the programming, you can modulate. So if you have a capsular effect, you can reduce the stimulation and then you have the, the capsular effect resolves. With a lesion, the effect is permanent for good and for bad. And if you impact on the internal capsule, you can have a permanent side effect. But as I told you, we have a high control. It's not frequent to have that side effect. Moving on to talking a little bit about patient selection for this study. And so when we think in a clinical context about the decision to intervene surgically in Parkinson's disease, those of us who are engaged in those clinical decisions think about it as a multidisciplinary collaborative approach where we are talking with our neurosurgery colleagues, our neuropsychology colleagues, talking with patients and other members of the team who are involved in that decision. And so as we think about the patients who are in this study, what were the clinical characteristics of the patients who underwent subthalamotomy in this trial with respect to their motor as well as their non-motor features? Are they typical or maybe they're not typical of patients for whom we might in other scenarios select for deep brain stimulation of the STN? We know well that one of the main factors for the success of a neurofunctional treatment is patient selection. If the patient selection is well done, you have more numbers of having a, a successful treatment, a successful outcome. Those patients treated with subthalamotomy were, in general terms, uh, to, to say this and point this out in general, I could say that a candidate for FUS ablation is a patient with asymmetrical Parkinsonism whose most affected site is not well controlled with medication, with drugs. Patients must be asymmetrical because ultrasound so far is applied only unilaterally. So you are only going to have real impact on one side of the body, on the most affected side. Although there are trials ongoing testing bilaterality, but this is another topic. Those patients today, those patients who come to our clinics and have marked bilateral Parkinsonism and marked bilateral impairment, to those patients, we perform deep brain stimulation. Those patients with generalized motor fluctuations or, or dyskinesia, those patients are better candidates for deep brain stimulation. I don't think that there is a one technique which is better than the other. I think that there are patients who will be better candidates for deep brain stimulation and others who will be better candidates for focus ultrasound. This is just another tool, another therapeutic tool that we have, and we have to learn how to use it properly. At this time, the unilateral restriction for the focused ultrasound ablation 
really tends to drive us towards patients who, as you said, have a much more asymmetric presentation of their motoric symptoms that have been refractory to medication therapy. And, and that may be, this time, ideal patient, while some of those other studies are still pending. And as we look forward and to think more critically about clinical applications, and, and as you said, this is not focused ultrasound versus deep brain stimulation, but more focused ultrasound and deep brain stimulation, both as options in our toolkit of treatments. I'm wondering, of now that this study is out and based on sort of other studies you and other groups have done, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about, you know, what is the current state of practice when it comes to focused ultrasound subthalamotomy? And so in your clinical practice, are you offering this treatment in those certain patients, perhaps those with a much more notable asymmetry of their motor features? Or are you waiting for some additional clinical data before you feel comfortable offering this outside of a research protocol? And what does the future hold for patient selection and incorporating this therapy into that treatment toolkit we have for patients with Parkinson's disease? We definitely offered therapy to those patients who we consider good candidates, and, and we, did, we do apply it regularly in our clinical practice. Uh, in fact, it is approved in Europe, not in the US, but it is approved uh, in Europe. And in our view, ultrasound in general, focus ultrasound and ultrasound subthalamotomy in particular, should be among the current therapeutic options to consider when you visit uh, a PD patients in your clinics. Consider that this is still a relatively young therapy, and while well, DBS has has 35 years of evolution and it has improved so much since it started. So we still need this learning curve to go on and improve how we do it, but we definitely offer it to our patients. You also mentioned bilaterality. This is something that needs to be addressed, needs to be explored, and there are trials ongoing. I'm aware of two of, the, of these trials and the results are promising. Probably if the technology is it's in the future, it's the same that we have now. It will not be possible to perform bilateral lesions simultaneously in a, in a single session at the same time because ultrasound lesions have a lot of surrounding edema. And I am not sure that a brain could tolerate a bilateral impact with such an inflammation, such an edema. So I don't think that they can be done simultaneously. But I'm pretty confident about the possibility of doing bilateral lesions in two times like a stage bilateral application. Thanks, Roland. I think your point that you've made is, is important, that we're talking about an eight-year-old therapy when we're talking about subthalamic ablation with focused ultrasound versus a three-and-a-half-decade-old therapy when we start talking about deep brain stimulation therapy. And there's a lot to learn and a lot to refine, but that's exciting. And any time that we can add more effective treatments to our toolkit for our patients with Parkinson's disease, I think that's absolutely something to be excited about. And it's been a pleasure learning all about this, and I wanted to thank you again for joining us. Thanks to you. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Raul Martinez Fernandez from HM Sinac at Puerta del Sur University Hospital in Madrid about his paper, Prospective Long Term Follow Up of Focused Ultrasound Unilateral Subthalamotomy for Parkinson Disease, which was published recently in Neurology. Everybody have a good day and thanks for listening. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening. And for letting us join you on your commute, while you're exercising, or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.